Discerning Hearts provides content dedicated to those on the spiritual journey. To continue production of these videos, prayers, and more, go to discerninghearts.com and click the donate link found there or inside the free Discerning Hearts app to make your donation. Thanks and God bless. Discerninghearts.com presents The Heart of the Spiritual Exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola with Father Anthony Wick. Father Wick is the Jesuit priest of the central and southern province of the United States. He currently acts as a retreat master at the White House Jesuit Retreat Center in St. Louis, Missouri. He also serves as a spiritual director at Kenrick Glennon Seminary in St. Louis. The Heart of the Spiritual Exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola with Father Anthony Wick. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Well, it just reminds me so much of what St. Catherine of Siena experienced in the dialogues when the Father, through her writings, would say that I don't allow temptations to make you weak. I allow them to make you strong. Mm, wow. And I think sometimes we can get confused too, Father, that when we will ascribe to a desolation as something that you know, the terms like dark night of the soul, or maybe we're just really tired and we need to rest, Mm -hmm. that there might be other things going on that maybe isn't so much an action that the Father is allowing, but it's something that is going on that is a non-spiritual desolation, but we call it that. Correct. Well said. Yes, that's a great distinction you're making too with the non-spiritual desolation, the spiritual desolation. So I may be depressed. I may have, there may be a chemical imbalance in me. I may be, so there may be something that happened. I just had a car accident, let's say, and I crunched my car and I don't know how I'm going to get another one. So that's a a desolation, not a spiritual desolation. Now, if it turns into my prayer where I'm starting to feel far from God now too, after my car has crashed or my incident happens or whatever, or someone rejects me in a friendship, then, then it becomes a spiritual desolation too. But you're right. It's not the same as the dark night of the soul. So for John of the Cross, so this is Carmelite spirituality now. For John of the Cross, the dark night of the soul, there's actually a joy that goes in there. There's a deeper joy that the Lord is purifying me. He's I can fall in love. There's similarities, but some differences too. I can fall in love with the gifts of God more than the giver. I can love God more for his gifts than for himself. And so there's a purification. It's a healthy purification with a deeper joy going on that he's purifying me of that disordered love so that I love him only for his own sake. I think that might be a good summary, you know, of what God's doing there in the the dark night of the soul. There is similarity for sure because St. Ignatius, this is strengthening my muscles, purifying my mind so that I I can continue on in the service and praise of God more boldly, more confidently, and nothing will steal my joy. No fox in the vineyard will steal my joy, to take that image from the uh, Song of Songs, right? The, the joy of my grapes or whatnot. There's there's always a way to praise the Lord. There's always a way to grow in faith, hope, and charity. There's always a way to enter more deeply into that loving relationship with our, with our God, with our Creator and, and Lord. And so St. Ignatius is convicted that we can keep growing in all of these situations, whether we're toggling left or from the left or the right. I just want to emphasize that we're praising the Lord from either the left or the right side. I used to say, Chris, that I used to make this undulating movement of up and down, kind of like waves on top of the wave. I'm in consolation and in, in, in desolation. I'm at the bottom of the wave. But I see it a little differently now because in the bottom of the wave, though I'm inclined towards low and base things, it's actually, that's the place to serve the Lord from. So I think they're, I prefer to see them on like the same level and just toggling from left or right. That, that I think is a better image because in desolation, I can serve the Lord in a powerful way, frankly, when he knows I'm not receiving his sensible graces and yet plenty of graces to fight off the evil spirit. It almost sounds as though in some ways he, with the experience of desolation, that it's a true suffering. And he doesn't want us to stay there. That it's not something that he desires for us, but he will allow it so that we move in the direction in which he's trying to prompt us towards. You know, I experience that as a parent often with our, you know, when you have kids, it's not that you want them to go through a particular 
period of suffering, whether, you know, I'm going to use something so incredibly simplistic here. I mean, whether it's a timeout or it's a, a, a taking away of something because something was not being used the way it should be, because I want them to seek me out to to find the right path so that this gift or whatever it is that they're using, whatever I have given to them to help them grow, that they use it in the appropriate way and not necessarily in a way that can be harmful. So I've removed that from them until they can, as it were, as a parent term, get a grip, (laughs) you know, or something like that. Again, I'm not trying to make it too simplistic, but it's an allowing by the father to, it's like a wake-up call, isn't it? So true. Yes, you're right. It's not a it's not a permanent state. It's not an ongoing state. This desolation. It's a it's a wake-up call, uh, and the Lord brings us back into consolation, and we're we come back in a different way. So there is a place for suffering. All of us have to suffer. You and I have to suffer in life. But it's it would be incorrect to say that my life is just principally suffering. You know, you're in my life, Chris. It's just a bunch of suffering with little just a brief dot of, of consolation every now and again. Actually, most of our lives are more consolation than desolation, the vast majority even. But we need those desolating times to strengthen us and to make us even more appreciative of what who God is in times of consolation. So yes, think about uh, back to your image of child rearing and little children. Like, do they spend most of their day in time out? Do they spend most of their, their time being looked down upon or frustrating? Do the parents grit their teeth most of the day and a few moments of joy with the child? No, oh, that's not true. Usually there's there's a lot of moments of, of uh, tenderness, being held, of joy, of eating together, whatnot. Uh, and yes, correction throughout the day, but the correction only keeps this child in a place of flourishing. That's the typical um, spiritual experience for the vast majority of all Catholics and Christians and as a matter of fact, St. Ignatius says, if you are in desolation, remember that consolation will return. And so just keep ho- holding on to those hopeful thoughts. Take new strength in the fact that I'm, I'm going to be coming back to consolation when the Lord wills. I, I trust in the Lord. And, and I also have plenty of graces, he says, to resist my enemies. I don't have to give in to them. And the Lord's given me all the strength I need. I'm not going to be tempted beyond my strength. Contrarily, if I'm in consolation, I need to humble myself, though, and not think that I'm God's gift to whatever. <laughs> I, that these are not my graces, that I'm a very spiritual guy, I must be a holy guy. Instead, I should humble myself and remember how, how weak I feel when I'm in desolation. And so, when I'm in consolation, I kind of need to humble myself, he says, and, and just recognize that, wow, this is, if it weren't for God's grace, I wouldn't be so buoyant right now. So, God, I'm floating on the ocean of mercy, you could say. <laughs> and the cause of my flotation is God's mercy. So I just rejoice in that that mercy that God floods upon me. No, I'm familiar with someone who kn- knew Mother Teresa very well. And I think it's been r- widely reported as well in print that she would say that when she received consolation, she would ask the Lord to hold back a little bit. So for those times when she was in desolation kind of, you know, easing the waves that will go up and that will go down. And she would say, but just grateful for the consolation, Lord, but hold back just a little so that, you know, the, the dip down won't, will not be as deep. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yes, she took a vow, a private vow. She felt inspired to take this vow to never refuse God anything, anything Jesus asked her, she wanted to embrace. She took a vow to, to do exactly that. And so... In all of her suffering, though, and I've read her diary, whatnot, there's still a deeper joy underneath all that suffering and that lamentation of, where are you, Lord? And that was my experience of being with her, the times I was with her, too. It wasn't um, it wasn't a stilted, there was a deep joy in her. There was some something going on there on a deeper level, that it wasn't complete desolation and dryness such that she was, there was just filled with pain and nothing but pain. There's there's something about Mother Teresa that has a deeper joy that she's tapped into at the same time that, that allowed her to keep smiling at, at her, at the patience given her or whatnot, keep allowing her to speak from that place of joy when you listen to her talk to the sisters. There's there's something much, much deeper going on there. So it's hard to 
her, her case is very unique, and it's not a paradigm for, uh-oh, I could be in desolation for 40 years. I don't think she's a paradigm at all for that. And even her own case is, is difficult to decipher. So most all of us, Chris, we we experience moments of desolation. It's a test for us to, to stay firm and to to work against those desolating thoughts. But uh, but uh, consolation is usually much more of our lives, an uh, experience that lasts for much more of our lives. So, and again, that can be even if I'm in pain, let's say I, I have I developed some kind of medical condition that might be on the natural level desolating, but it doesn't have to become spiritual desolation. I might actually feel very close with the Lord in the midst of that pain. And especially intimate, that suffering becomes an invitation to intimacy. Or when I lost my father a few years ago, you know, there was there was deep intimacy that went. I had a lot of tears, but it was actually for the beauty of his life. It was really quite amazing. <laughs> When I was flying home for the funeral, I was in tears the whole time. And that was the one time I was grateful to have masks. The whole time people couldn't see this crying priest the whole time. But I was writing the homily for his funeral. And I was just so overwhelmed by the beauty of his life and my vocation enwrapped within his. Oh, wow. That was really amazing. So it was a spiritual cons- consolation of lots of tears. And yet people would probably think, oh, you lost your dad. You must be in great desolation. And it's like, I feel really, really close to the Lord right now. It's consolation, so with lots of tears. This is Chris McGregor of Discerning Hearts, a nonprofit Catholic apostolate dedicated to evangelization and spiritual formation through the use of new media. Discerning Hearts creates engaging multimedia specializing in audio and video productions which are faithful to the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church and its rich, authentic spiritual tradition. Its mission responds to the Church's call to use the media for evangelization, catechesis, and spiritual renewal. We have made a commitment since the beginning to make the truth shared through Discerning Hearts totally free to users throughout the world. Besides our website, DiscerningHearts.com, Discerning Hearts has a newly updated free app where users can find all their favorite Discerning Hearts programming, including Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Deacon James Keating, Mike Aquilina, Dr. Matthew Bunsen, and so many more. There, too, you'll find numerous beautifully produced devotionals and novenas, including the Holy Rosary and Stations of the Cross, to help users create a sacred time for prayer wherever they may be. Discerning Hearts programming can be found on numerous streaming platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and so many more. Discerning Hearts also has an ever-growing YouTube channel. Discerning Hearts online spiritual retreats and seminars have helped souls in North and South America, Europe, Africa, Australia, the Middle East, and the Philippines. For many people all around the world, Discerning Hearts is a daily source of inspiration, spiritual nourishment, and encouragement. We can only do this thanks to the generous financial support of our friends and benefactors. Please consider donating to our mission today. The world is looking for answers, for spiritual guidance and authentic discernment, for relationship and community. Your support is very much needed and appreciated. Please keep our mission in your prayers and tell a friend about Discerning Hearts. So, lastly, St. Ignatius gives the in this first week, the three typical ways that the evil spirit works on you and me. And he's going to use trickery to get us to his own designs and to fall off into receiving his inspirations and following his inspirations. Three typical ways. As an evil man, as an evil woman, as an evil army chieftain. And so uh, he starts in the 12th rule with this evil woman. Now, it's not common parlance. People are really concerned about that. Is he scapegoating or something, a woman? So, you could put it in terms of, I think Father Gallagher speaks about a petulant child that gets angry or something, but whatever. The point is that whatever, whether woman or man, I don't think really makes a difference. The point is someone who 
who nags us into doing what they want us to do. Let's say, take a drug, you know, come on, Father Anthony, take this. Everybody does it. It's not a big deal. Huh? Or play with this, this little device on the internet or open up this browser or try this little drug or try, you know, any kind of temptation so that the evil spirit will uh, nag us into doing something until we finally do it. So I'll, I don't make a show of strength. I just kind of like, oh, yeah, well, I really shouldn't do that. I don't really want to do that. I know I shouldn't. I don't really, oh, I don't know. I don't make a, a show of strength. And he says when, when that evil spirit behaves like that, that person who's pushing us, who's nagging us into darkness, and if we let that, that evil spirit keep nagging us into, come on, it's not a big deal, pocketing that money, Father Anthony, or whatever I'm doing, huh? or taking extra alcohol or this drug that that's not healthy or maybe even illegal. Like I need to stand up to that evil spirit and make a show of strength. And when I do, that evil spirit will flee. So we have this ability again to overcome these evil spirits. And when that spirit's nagging me to to think badly about a person, to gossip about them, to whatever it is, Chris, I need to make a show of strength and say, I'm not going there. <laughs> I need to have a holy violence. Even Jesus says, uh, the violent bear it away, says uh, Flannery O'Connor, right? That only the violent will make it to heaven, meaning I stand up to that. Their holy violence like, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not giving into that temptation, that whatever, maybe a sexual temptation, say. Huh? Like, I'm not going there. I'm not going to allow this to plague me. I'm not going to watch this anymore. I'm exiting out. I'm, I'm shutting off my computer. I'm shutting off this program. I'm not going to flip through channels and see how much I can justify I, I stand up against that that evil spirit. He says, if you don't do that, if you don't stand up against this evil spirit as he nags me into doing something, there, if I have fear or I lose heart, there's no beast so wild on the face of the earth as the enemy of our human nature and following out his damnable intention with so great malice. <laughs> so the enemy of the human nature, that's so interesting, isn't it? It speaks of the Catholic view of human nature that's very positive. But the enemy of human nature has damnable intentions, totally wants us under his standard. He wants us in hell with him. You know, he's, he's declared war, Revelations 12, huh? against all the offspring of the woman, whom you and I are. And he wants us, as that's the one way he can get back at God, is to destroy his handiwork and to get his handiwork to commit one unrepentant mortal sin that will damn them for eternity. So we need to stand up to those temptations towards evil there in that when we're nagged uh, into doing uh, such a thing like that. Okay, as the evil man, he gives an example in the 13th rule of a man who will try to seduce us. If you and I were the daughter of a good man, that evil man will try to seduce us and he'll send us secret love letters. And as long as he can keep those secret love letters, exactly that, secret, uh, he'll eventually win us over because he's pretty wily. The evil spirit's pretty wily. He'll lead us into something really dark and even sinister. But if I ever open up those love letters, not really love, of course, to my father, my good father, he gets involved, and that's going to be the end of that relationship. So St. Ignatius says, we need to have someone in our life, some spiritual person, doesn't have to be a priest, but someone walking the spiritual walk, to whom we reveal, we reveal what our temptations are. We need to have accountability, someone who talks about the way that we're tempted, the little secret love letters from Satan that you and I get are our temptations to want to hurt somebody or to speak badly about them or to, I'm tempted by this, I want to use that. Here's the way I'm tempted in sensuality, in creature comforts. Here's the way I'm tempted in vanity, drawing attention to myself. Here's the way I'm tempted in pride, thinking I know better than everybody else. So that's how you overcome that licentious lover, he says, this evil man who's trying to seduce us into, into darkness is to reveal, uh, to manifest what these dark designs are. And once we do, they lose their strength. It's not unlike confession, Chris, when you and I go to confession. It, just getting that all out there, it, Satan loses his toehold in us. Because as soon as I admit that I did this and this and this, and I didn't do that and that and that, it's already separated from me. I'm no longer carrying it on myself. And so the Lord can take it upon himself, pay the price for it, and give me new freedom. Lastly, the evil army chieftain, so who's trying to plunder our fortress, namely our soul, 
He's a smart enough chieftain. He looks around, he prowls around, you know, paces around the whole stronghold of our soul, and he's always going to attack us by our weakest link, <laughs> by our weakest place where we're not very virtuous. He'll survey our different virtues. He's smart enough to attack by the weakest point of our fortress. And so what do you and I need to do? We need to buttress that side of our fortress. So if I'm particularly weak at night when I'm tired, go on the internet, I tend to overdo the news or other websites or whatnot. I need to really buttress that. I know some families, for instance, that they don't let their kids charge the phone in their own room. All the phones are charged on the common dining room, which makes a lot of sense to me because there's so many temptations that go with phone use and open internet access in the middle of the night. So that's just one example. But like we need to buttress that side where we're weak. I need to know where I'm weak. That's part of the first step of the spiritual life. Know thyself, huh? Where am I weak? I need to buttress that side. Maybe I'm tempted to gossip with this particular person. All right, I need to be really, really careful about that. Maybe I tend to talk badly about bishops or priests huh? or about this religious order or I tend to really be down on, on this person in the church or this political party or this person in politics and I, I just like, I can't, it never goes, it just goes down and down and down for me. I need to buttress that side huh? uh, of my weakness. Satan's smart enough to attack us by the weakest side, or as they say, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. If you had two tractors pulling apart a chain, you know it's going to break wherever, whichever link is the weakest, that's where the chain will break. So that's the link we need to buttress a little more. We need to double up on that link. So knowing myself, what's my common temptation? How do I use food or drink or gaming uh, in an unhealthy way? What's What are my weak links here? What's my weakest link? And how am I buttressing that? so that I don't fall off the cliff as Satan would like to lead me. That can be tough, Father, because you just named off a bunch of things that I'm doing right now. <laughs> <So> <laughs> I think it's the, the experience of so many out there because we can say, and I know I'll, I'll just speak for myself, I can say I'm not doing those bigger things. I'm not talking about everybody that way. I'm not looking, but there's that one person that gets under my skin. Or there's this stress in my life, and so I need to. I need an outlet, don't I? I need to get it out of me. I need to vent so I don't explode, or whatever that might be. We hear that very often, and so trying to find that healthy balance, and you need that guide. You need somebody to help you out sometimes. I definitely, and I, and I think a sense of humor is very helpful too. When I can hear, oh, I know what you're trying to do, Satan. I recognize you. You know, here you're you you wanting me to click on this site, aren't you? You know, that that's a little tempting for me in one way or another. Here you want me to go into a shopping mode or shopping spree, or you know, you want me to drink a little extra alcohol tonight because it's been a tough day. Uh, I know where you're coming from. I think it's helpful to kind of laugh when you see that evil spirit. Like, I'm not letting you in. I know who you are. You know, and then with a show of strength, just kind of crush Satan's head. Uh, God is infinitely more powerful than his creatures. And so Mary is rightfully depicted like with her hands sweetly folded, looking at you and me, maybe open hands in prayer, while crushing Satan's head. So that should be our motto too. God is infinitely greater than his creature. Satan's but a creature. Any demon's but a creature, a fallen angel. And so we've got God on our side. So we can just pray and squish. And when we recognize that, oh, that's that tempting evil spirit. Ha ha, I got you, you know? And we... We crush his little head like a cockroach. We don't fear Satan. We don't fear demons because that'll give them a space to work on us. We crush them like cockroaches, but you've got to have that attitude of pray and squish. you got to be like the Blessed Mother. I never heard of like that before, a squish. I kind of, I like that. That's good. It's a very uh, meaty response. I mean, it's very full. And part of that too, I mean, in that self-knowledge, is identifying, and you can tell me if I'm going down a path that maybe St. Ignatius didn't intend, but many of us can have gone through a process where we know the feeling of rejection when we feel it inside of ourselves. This goes back to maybe a core wound of, or abandonment or something like that. So when something triggers that, I know I find myself at some point saying, well, I just felt rejected. They didn't select me, or I'm not the one that is the standout, or they got something over me. And 
I have to, by identifying that, okay, that's rejection. Well, I, I turn that over to you, Lord. I'm, I'll am i carry it, and it's going to hurt, but you felt it too, so, okay. Help me Thank to deal with so it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for bringing up wounds. That's really good, Chris. So true. We all have these different wounds from our past, whether over a long period or one particular traumatic situation, where I've got a wound perhaps of abandonment or confusion or fear or hopelessness or powerness, powerlessness or rejection or shame. So whatever the wound doesn't really matter what it is, but it does become an inner way for the evil spirit to play on me. Like I do feel, let's say it's abandonment, right? That that nobody cares, nobody gets me, nobody really knows Father Anthony. And so that little experience triggers that and I begin to go down this this bad rabbit hole unless I buttress, I'd be like, oh no, 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 that's the evil spirit playing on that wound. That this person, it just happened this way, not everyone's gonna like what I said or the talk I gave or whatnot, that's okay. And I can push back against that, I can laugh at that temptation to just go down into this woundedness and buttress myself against that, but catch myself. That's that's the key. So, and, and ask the Lord to keep healing those wounds too, because I might still have some pus from that wound. I might still believe that there's something wrong with me. Let's say the wound is shame, where I actually feel I am bad. Not that I've just done bad, but I actually am bad. I am dirty. And so, whenever something happens to me where I begin to think that I am that, like, Invite the Lord in there. Please touch me there, Lord. Please heal me there. Again, please please give me your life, your your true flesh. Heal that leprosy in me of that wound, that false belief I have that I've kind of integrated. I've perhaps made my own, the critiques of others. They said I was bad. I've been cursed before by my parents or whatever, some authority figure, and I've kind of taken that curse on myself, and I'm a poor excuse of a human being. All these things. And I've, I've turned this into a shame wound, which becomes an easy entryway for that evil spirit. So I really need to to buttress that and recognize the signs of that. That's um, so important that we, in that self-knowledge, we recognize the source of these things. This is you were saying, Chris. So thank you for bringing up the, the notion of wounds, because you're right, that becomes a, a very easy entryway for the evil spirit to play on those weaknesses that are, might be very significant from our, our past, and the Lord's still working on and healing on and healing, but um, but it becomes, if we're not careful, if we're not cognizant of them, it becomes an easy entryway for the wrong spirit. We'll continue our conversation in our next episode. You've been listening to The Heart of the Spiritual Exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola with Father Anthony Wick. This episode, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission, which is to offer authentic and rock-solid spiritual formation freely to souls around the world. And if you feel us worthy, please consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible, to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about DiscerningHearts.com and join us next time for The Heart of the Spiritual Exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola with Father Anthony Wick.